Hey, welcome to The Table Church Online. My name is Jesse, and I'm one of the leaders here at The Table. We're so glad that you have joined us for worship today. In just a second, we're going to hear a word from our pastor. And I want to encourage you to stick around afterwards. There's a couple of things I want to call your attention to at the end. So let's hear from our pastor. Hey, good morning, guys. My name is Cody. I get to be the pastor here at The Table Church, and we are so glad that you're with us today. We're going to be reading out of Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 15 through 17 today. And so... Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, no worries. The words are going to be on the screen for you. Um, if you. And also, if you don't have a Bible, please feel free um, to pick one of those up on your way out this morning. We want you to have a copy of the Bible. Um, or you can download one online. Go to Version app or the Crossway app, either one. Um, great, great resources for having the Word of God with you so that you can have the Word of God in you. So uh, let's go ahead and read this um, together. Listen as I read. He, speaking about Jesus... He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all of creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things are. Hold together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would uh, speak through your word. Um, God, 
It is your word that has power and has authority. God, I pray um, that I would explain it well, but God, that people would respond to you and to your word, not just to me. God, may, may you set our hearts ablaze today with the glory that is revealed in this text about who you are, that you are supreme over everything, over all things, past, present, and future. God, may we see that. May we see you rightly this morning. We ask it for Jesus' sake. We ask it for our deep joy. And we ask it ultimately for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Um, as I said, if you're just now coming in, my name's Cody. I get to be the pastor here at the table. And we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. We're um, right in the middle of a series called Supreme um, as we're looking at this. And basically, this text that we're in this morning is why we entitled this sermon series Supreme. This text, what we think, it, what we think about it is that it's probably an early Christian hymn. Um, you may have recognized as I was reading it that like this, this just kind of flows. It, it kind of has more of a poetic feel to it. And it is one of the highest, um, most important Christological passages in all of the Bible. It's, it, and, and, and Paul may have written it, maybe not. And even if he didn't, though, it's still in the inspired word of God that Paul said, I'm going to use this and put this for this church because I want this church, which is a young church, like we're a young church, at Colossae filled with a lot of young believers, like we're filled with a lot of newer believers that are, that are, are getting to know Jesus. They're trying to live a life that pleases Him, that glorifies Him. They're trying to follow Him in the midst of some of their family, some of their friends, some of their co-workers not understanding what Jesus is all about. They don't believe in the Jesus that they believe in. And he is trying to strengthen and bolster their faith. And so Paul takes this hymn, whether he writes it or whether he borrows it, he says, this is good stuff. They need to know who this Jesus is that they are following. And with that said, what Paul is going to get to in the book of Colossians, he's saying that life just makes more sense when it's oriented around the one who created all of life. Your life makes more sense when it is oriented, radically oriented around Jesus Christ who created your life, gave you your life, and created all of the lives around your life. All of the lives before your life and all of the lives that will come after your life. God, through Jesus, by Jesus, for Jesus, created all of that. Now, that is some high Christological stuff, right? But it has incredible practical relevance because it, like, if, if we're not in orbit around Jesus... You, you spin off into space pretty fast. Some of y'all may already be spun off as it is, and you're just circling back. And what I'm hoping today is that if that's you, that you will get sucked in to the gravitational pull of Jesus Christ. Because life just makes more sense. I'm not saying that He will make your life perfect. I'm not saying that He will make your life better in the way that you think it's better. I'm saying it will make more sense. He can make sense out of suffering. Make sense out of shame. Make sense out of pain. Jesus Christ just makes sense out of all of those things that tend to spin us off. So, I was getting my hair cut this uh, last, just a couple of days ago. Um, my friend Jim recommended this place. It's called Keep It Cut. And so um, if anybody listens to this, great, Keep It Cut. Maybe they'll give me like a, you know, throwback, some promo. So it's like 35 bucks a month for like, I think like the deal is called like the full Monty or something like that. Like they'll trim like the hair, the beard. And I got like a lot of caveman stuff going on. So like 35 bucks a month, 
we'll, 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 we'll keep you trimmed up, keep it cut as many times as you want. So I can go there like every day if I wanted to, right? So I go the first time, I didn't like it. But it was free, and I think they charged me again. So I'm like, I'm at least going to get my money's worth. So go back. I, that's kind of how I operate. So I, I go back, and I get this guy that has never cut my hair. Now, when I booked it, I didn't know. I didn't know if it was going to be a guy or a girl. Okay? I ain't going to tell you the name. It was just, it could go either way. It was a guy. And into the conversation, I'm not going to tell you everything that he said, but, like, we just launch into this discussion like, he starts telling me, like, his political views, his views on morality, what he votes, the fact that he doesn't vote because none of the, pop, none of the, of the politicians are focused on the real issues that matter, which is overpopulation. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. So, I, like, I'm just, like, trying to catch up. Like, usually I don't get into those kind of conversations until, you know, three or four visits. But like, he's just, bam, all in there. Oh, okay. So I start asking questions, like, well, you know, what's your moral basis for that? Like, what do you, like, he, look, literally, he said this to me. He goes, he goes, I think the government ought to start giving, like, incentives for birth control. And I'm like, like, the pill? He goes, no, like, for surgeries. I'm like, oh, okay, that you're coming from a different lane? Oh, okay, all right. So we're just trying to, you know, but here's the thing, like, his life is just broken. And he's just saying all these things. But there's no, there's no basis for it. And I, so when I start pressing on that, I'm like, I'm like, so the world is broken, right? He goes, oh, yeah. You know, it's all screwed up. I'm like, so how do, what is the answer? Oh, I don't know. So I'm like, okay, I don't have time to get into all this with him today. But I'm totally going back and getting my hair cut from that guy. <laughs> Even if I didn't like the way he cut it as good as some of the other guys I've been to, I'm totally going to go sit in that chair again. Because life doesn't make sense to him. And so he's trying to make sense of it the best he can. He's just trying to make sense of it the best he can. And maybe you're like that. And maybe you're trying this church thing. You're trying to understand Jesus. You're, you're trying to like, like life has dealt you some, you know, a, a tough hand. And you're, and you're just, you're grasping at straws, trying to make sense of it. And I want to say, if that is you, we are glad that you are here. And I do believe that Jesus does make sense of this life. I believe that life makes more sense oriented around Christ. I have lived life not oriented around Christ. And it doesn't make as much sense. Let's look at these three things. Three reasons. Three reasons why I believe that life makes more sense oriented around Christ. and What Paul lays out for us. Number one. Because Christ makes sense of God. I don't know about you, but most people that I encounter believe that there's a God. It's part of, why, it's part of the culture that we live in. We live in a postmodern culture. We um, used to, um, there seemed like there was more people um, in, in the modern era that they're, that they believe that because God can't be explained by science and can't like with, with like actual proofs, well... We, we're going to say that there is no God. But in the postmodern era, that's not really where we believe. We, we totally believe in the supernatural. We totally believe that if, if, of, of higher beings, of things that are created. The thing is, we just don't understand it. And so there's a lot of people, probably your friends, family, neighbors, they believe that there's a God, but they really don't understand Him. I'll give you an example. I was talking with um, one of our, our, our new believers um, just this morning, who's been sharing the gospel and sharing his faith, sharing his story with family. And he says, yeah, I believe in God, but he's dead. It's like, he believes in God, but he doesn't understand him. He doesn't even understand the resurrection. He believes that there's a God, but why would he give his life to that God since he's dead? And so he's taking it just from a dead religion. Christ makes God make sense. What do I, what, why, where do I get that? Look at what the text says. He is the image of the invisible God. The Bible is clear that no one has ever seen God. The only guy that came close to seeing God was a guy by the name of Moses. 
that talked with God like closer than any other human. And one time when he was interceding for his people, like God was ready to wipe the people out. He said, please, Lord, don't do this. And he gets this, he, he, he gets the Ten Commandments. He asks God, he goes, God, show me your glory. God says, you can't handle it. Kind of like Jack Nicholson on a, on a Few Good Men. You can't handle it. You know, it was like that. I, that's how I imagine it going down. I don't know. But so, uh, you know, like, that's pretty bad that I think God is like Colonel Jessup. But, okay. Anyway, like he, he, but he did say, he's like, it's like, if you see me, you're going to die. You can't behold my glory. You can't. So here's what happens. He, and Moses is like, I, I just want to see who I'm talking to. I, I just, just reveal yourself. Just let me see. He goes, I'll tell you what. You, you go over there and stand in the corner. Put your face in the cleft of the rock. He goes, I'm going to pass by. My glory is going to pass you by. And so the scripture says that he passed by. By the way, none of this is in the notes. I don't even know where it's at in the Bible. Your homework assignment, go look it up. Find it out. He passes by. Like Moses like sees the, like the, the backside for like a second or less out of his peripheral vision. And he comes back down the mountain and his like face is glowing for like 40 days. Like people are freaked out. They're like, like you got to put a cloak over Moses now like a Jedi. We can't handle him. Just because he just saw the glory of God for just a second, just bare out of his peripheral vision, just a flash. That's like we can't handle the glory of God. God is invisible to us. We don't understand him. We, like no one has ever seen God. We can't, even if we could see Him, we can't behold Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But God does want to be known and the fullness of the revelation of God for us as broken, fallen humans is found in the man, in the person, in the body, Jesus Christ. He is the image of of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to make sense of God, get to know Christ. Get to know Jesus. What is God like? He's like Jesus. He's he's, he's like Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And this is not the only place in Scripture where it says this. Look at John chapter 1, verse 18. John chapter 1, verse 18, the gospel writer says, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. That's talking about no no one knows God. Jesus makes God known. How many of you want to know God? Know Christ. Know Christ. Life makes more sense when it's oriented around Christ, because He makes God make sense. There's a lot of people that say, oh yeah, I believe in God, but then they have a really, really warped idea about like what God is like. Here's a common one. Some people say, yeah, I believe in God. Well, do you believe He's all-powerful? Well, no. Well, why don't you believe He's all-powerful? Well, because, you know, bad stuff happens. Oh, well, so is there, a, is there something more powerful than God? Well, no. Well, then what about the bad stuff? Well, I don't know. I, didn't, I didn't, wasn't thinking about this when I woke up this morning. Leave me alone. You know? Or they go the other way and they're like, do you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. So, God is God all powerful? Yeah. Well, what about bad stuff? Yeah, He caused it to happen. So, God's the author of evil? I guess so. Like that, like it's just they just it, it's complicated. But then you then you take the person of Jesus who comes into this earth and totally deals with pain and suffering and evil, and yet is not callous. I mean, think about this for a second. The shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna unpack that today. But I just want you to know I can. If I wanted to, we could stay here for the next five hours just unpacking those two words. A God who is all-powerful, but yet will come down and weep with us? A God who knew that He would raise Lazarus back from the dead and yet would enter into the pain and the suffering of Mary and Martha and weep with them even though He knew what He was going to do? 
Our God understands us. Our God relates to us, and He's done it through the person and the work and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. But it's not just in John 1.18. It's also in John 14.9. Jesus said to him, he says this to God named Philip. He goes, have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Now, that's an arrogant thing for somebody to say if they're not God. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. If you want to know God, if you want to make sense of God, get into the Gospels. Learn about Jesus. Watch Him and the way He reacted and interacted and responded and initiated with people. Get to know Jesus. He will help you make sense of God. But it's not only there. It's also in Hebrews chapter 1-3. Hebrews chapter 1-3 says that Jesus says He is the radiance of of the glory of God. That glory of God that made Moses' face shine for 40 days and 40 nights and all of Israel had to put a Jedi cloak on him so they could hide him. Jesus, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. You have to understand this. Like I have a boy and he's, he's a lot like me and he's a lot like his mom, but he's not the exact imprint of my nature. And thank God for that. <laughs> right? But Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. When you read about Jesus, when you really get into the Word and you say, oh, that's what it's like. You can know that as you're reading about Jesus, as you're discovering who Jesus is, as you're experiencing Christ, you can say, that's what God is like. The exact imprint of of God, this God that has been invisible to me that I have never understood, now I see what He's like because I can see and know what Jesus was like because He is the God who took on flesh, who became man and dwelt among us and of His fullness we have received. There was an older man that I went to church with when I was a kid. His name was Jeff Thomas. Jess knew the Bible unlike anybody I'd ever seen. And he knew Jesus. And he knew that the Bible was all about Jesus. That's why he knew Jesus so well, because he knew the Bible. And the reason he knew the Bible so well is because he wanted to know more about Jesus. And that's why he spent so much time reading it. And all that, the, all that Bible knowledge just oozed out of old Jess. It just seeped out of him. It, Jesus infected how Jess Thomas talked. It infected how he lived. And I wanted to be like that. I, I wanted to be like that. I, I, I made a commitment when, when I was around Jess. I was, I was like, I, I'm going to spend time. Because I asked Jess one time, I was like, how did you get to know the Bible so well? He goes, just lots of years of reading it every day, man. Okay. Like it wasn't something supernatural. It wasn't something, it was, it was a long, it was long, and I just committed. I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. And from that day I said, I'm going to start trying to read the Bible through every year. This is before I was called to ministry. This is before I, I, I knew I was going to be a preacher or anything like that. Jess wasn't a preacher. He wasn't anything like that. But he knew the Bible and he knew the God of the Bible and he knew Christ. And I was like, I want to be like that. And if that means I've got to spend time in the Word, I'm going to do that. And that's something that you can do. Do you want to know God? Do you want to know God? If you want to know God, get to know Jesus. And how, how you do that. Here's what very practical step I'm going to ask you to take. If you say, I've never read, I've never read with anybody the, the Bible. I've never had anybody explain it to me, but I, I would like for somebody to do that. I'm going to ask you at the end of the service today, when, we, when we're done, we say amen. There's an info table. You can't miss it when you turn and walk out of here. Unless you just like dart out the side door, go beyond the curtains. You can't miss it. It's the info table. It's, I'm looking at it right now. I want you to go to the info table. There's going to be a lady there serving. I think her name is Linda. Linda, if you're not serving, you are now. You've got to get back there. And just sign up and say, I want to read through the Gospel of Mark 
with somebody. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest Gospel account that we have. It's 15 chapters. You can read one chapter a day and be through, through it in two weeks. So I'm going to ask you to commit to that. Read through the Gospel of Mark, one chapter a day, and two meetings with somebody. And you say, well, I, I, maybe you already have somebody picked out that you want to read it with. Great, go and, go and talk to them. You can just bypass the info table, and you can just go talk to that person. But if you're like, I don't know who I should do this with, go to the info table and tell them that's what you want to do, and we'll get you connected with somebody. We, if you want to know God, get to know Jesus. And if the way you get to know Jesus is through the gospel accounts. Read through the gospels. And you, if you get through the gospel of Mark, and you're like, I know some stuff about him, but I don't really know him yet. I, you know, but I still want to learn more. You're in luck because there's three more. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? And we'll just read through all of them with you until you know him. All right? So I will commit that. I will commit our church to you for that. I will commit myself to you for that. I will read through that with you. Okay? And other people will read through. We want you to know God. And the way you get to know God is knowing Jesus. And the way you get to know Jesus is through the Gospels. Okay, number two, life makes more sense oriented around Christ because he makes God make sense. But also, life makes more sense oriented around Christ because all things were created by, through, and for Jesus. Look at what it says at the end of verse 15. Verse 15 ends with a description of Jesus as the firstborn of all creation. Now this doesn't mean that Jesus is a created being, which some religions will teach you. He's not a created being. He is the, the person of Christ is eternally pre-existent. That means that He has always been as God has always been. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The word for God there is Elohim, which in the Hebrew is plural. And then just a few verses later it says, And the Spirit of God hovered over the faces of the deep. And then, just a few verses later, God says, Let us make man in our image. He uses two plural pronouns. God is Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus has always been, if He is uncreated as God and the Spirit are uncreated, then what does He mean by saying He's the firstborn? Because that, like that sounds like a created thing. What He means, this is not a description about time as much as it is a description about the preeminence of Christ, which he's going to state next week when Jesse Powell preaches for us and unpacks verses 18 through 20. It's the preeminence of Christ, meaning that he is the first, the idea of firstborn means he is preeminent. He is of first priority. He is of first order over all of creation. And his preeminence is directly tied to his pre existence. He is before all things, which he tells us down in verse 17 of our text here today. He has always been. Now the practical outworkings of that, about how it makes our life make sense, is that Jesus has been around a long time. He's seen some stuff. Let me just put it, uh, we've talked real high, let me just put it down here real low for you. There's not a thing in your life in your past, in your present, or in your future that will ever make Jesus go, can't figure that out. There's nothing in your life that Jesus will respond to and say, never seen that before. Nothing. He has seen it all. He's seen it all. You are... You are not going to shock him. You are not going to surprise him. All things are created by, through, and for him. That idea, were created, that is a perfect tense verb. Here's what I mean 
by perfect tense verbs. Perfect tense, see, we have past, present, and future like in the English language. Greek has like all these extras. Perfect tense verb means this. Here's the, here's the, the impact of a perfect tense verb. It is a past action with a continuing into the present and into the future result. Jesus saved me, and he is still saving me. He saved me. He's not going to chunk me back. He's going to continue holding on. You, listen, you let Jesus get a hold of you, you ain't never had anybody get a hold of you like Jesus gets a hold of you because he will not let go. He will not let you go he saves and that's going to continue on paul says it this way in philippians he goes he who began a good work in you will complete it faithful is he who called you and he will do it he doesn't stop life makes more sense when it is oriented around christ because he makes sense of god and because everything Thing that we see and experience was created by him. He goes on, he says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. For him. That means your life was created by, through, and for Christ. Your kids were created by, through, and for Christ. This church was created by, through, and for Christ. Wherever you look, this is a quote from one of the commentators I read, wherever you look or whatever realities you think of, you discover entities which, even if they do not acknowledge the fact, owe their very existence to Christ. They are His Handiwork. I put. You look at a Ferrari. I don't know about you, but I, I look at a Ferrari. I don't glorify Enzo. I glorify God, who made Enzo, who made a company that made Ferrari. And I always picture him in red. All things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. F.F. Bruce says this, For those who have been redeemed by Christ, the universe has no ultimate terrors. Why are you so fearful? Do you know that that's the number one command in the Bible? Don't fear. I wonder why that's said so often. Probably because we're prone to it. For those who have been redeemed by Christ, the universe has no ultimate terrors. They know that their Redeemer is also creator, ruler, and goal of all. For Him, all things were created. All things, you and I, are included in that all things. Augustine of Hippo says this in his confessions. He says, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. So do you want to make sense of your life? Let the one who created your life and all of the life around it inform you about your life. Believe what he says about you. Orient yourself around Him and for Him. There's a couple of practical steps for this. You cannot do this without community. You cannot do this on your own. Which is why we planted this church. We, we are not meant to be alone. In, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he, all the stuff, He looked around, He had created man, and the first thing, He had said, he looked at the plants, he looked at the stars, he looked at the sun, he looked at the dirt, he looked at the water, he looked at everything, and he said, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then he said, it's not good. Now, when you and I look at something, we say, ah, that ain't good. Okay, 
no, no big deal. But when God says something's not good, that has like cosmic reality. I mean, it, implications. And you know what he said was not good? It's not good for man to be alone. Um, so you said, oh, so he gave him a wife. That's, yes. And then he said, be fruitful and multiply because we're meant for community. Here's the reality. You have blind spots. And the reason you say, no, I don't, is because you have blind spots. <laughs> you and I got them. We all have them. And we need other eyes on us. It'd be great if we were like a horse and we could see like, you know, 270 degrees. But that's not the way that God created you and I. We have front facing. We, we see, I mean, 180 is about as good as we can do it. Right? That's, that's as good as you and I can, can do it. We need people around us that are, you know, helping us. So this is why with community, when you, what we would encourage you to do is get into a group. Get into a group where you're doing life with one another. You're not meant to do this on your own. You're going to be very, very limited if you're trying to just, you know, me and Jesus, that's all it is. No, he's created you for community. You need more people. So, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you to go to the info table and ask them about getting into a community group and, do, and start doing life with people, getting to know and building those relationships. Because it'll take some time. It, I understand. I'm, I'm not saying you should go to your first group and, like, share all of your deep, dark, sordid history. You know, I know that you're not going to do that. That's going to take time. And I want you to know that we, I, I trust every one of our groups. I do. I've been to every one of them. I host one in my home. I trust every one of our groups that you will be loved well, that you will be told the truth in love, and that you can tell the truth. Okay? Third thing, and we got to go. we got, we got to get on. Life makes more sense oriented around Christ because Christ makes God make sense and because all things were created by Him, through Him, and for Him. And lastly, because He holds all things together. Look at verse 17. As I said earlier, he is before all things. And then this last part, and in him, all things hold together. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life where I have felt un, and undoubtedly will feel again that my life is going to fly apart. I felt it about a month ago as we were preparing for the wedding. Dealing also with a wife recovering from ACL surgery. And then car problems. And then a son that is getting ready to go to boot camp. Like it just, like this life that I've put together, like we've, we've always had these cars, we've always had these kids in our home, and now it's just, it's all gone. Lord, I, what? Sometimes I feel like my life is going to fly apart. I know none of y'all ever feel like that. You're so much more spiritual. You're so much more mature in Christ. And you would never feel, feel that. That's why I need you guys. So when, when, I, when I'm there and I, and I feel that way, this verse means the world to me. In Him, all things, all things hold together in Him. My family, car parts, church, my emotions, my health, all things, everything. All, all of those things I listed, those are all things. And they're included in all things. It grounds me to Christ who won't let me fly apart but instead has held me together time and time again and will always do so. Why? Because he promised. He goes, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Why can he say that? Because he holds all things together. He created it. He knows it. He understands it. And he is more than capable of holding it all together. 
He keeps this, I mean, think about this for just a second. He keeps this planet spinning at precisely the right speed. He keeps it on its axis, precisely on its axis. He keeps it rotating around the sun in its orbit. And he has stopped it, at least while we've been here, from like an asteroid hitting it and wiping out the planet. He has sustained all of this. And if he can do all that, if he can keep it spinning, if he can keep it in its orbit, if he can keep it on its axis, he can hold you together. You are not too much for him. Don't let your pride think that. Don't let your pride lead you to that conclusion that you're too much for God. No, no, no. He's too much for you. That's the reality. But in your pride, you don't want to admit that. You want to, because you're the center of the universe. And I'm just telling you, maybe this is your blind spot. You aren't. You aren't. It's not about you. It never has been, and guess what? It never will be. You can go to five years and pay for therapy before you arrive at that conclusion. I just gave it to you for free. Orienting your life around the one who created all things and the one for whom all things were created and the one in whom all things hold together is the best decision you can make. The more you get to know him, the more he holds you together. It's why old Jess was so attractive. That that life was so attractive to me as a young man. whose Life was spinning out of control. I'm like, that guy has it all together. And the reason he had it all together is because someone had him all together. And that person was Christ. Hebrews 1.3 says this. That after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. That's the second half of what I quoted earlier underneath The first point, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And then after that, the Hebrew author says this, and after making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I'm going to ask you to submit yourself to the gravitational pull of Jesus Christ. Let him hold you together. He's been holding all things together for a long time. He knows what he's doing. Let him hold you together. Let him put you back together. You may have stumbled in here today broken and you may think that you are completely beyond repair. I am saying you are not. You are not beyond the redemptive love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. By whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created. So I'm going to give four invitations. For those of you who know and follow Jesus, you've been baptized, you're walking in repentance, we're going to invite you to come and take communion. And those of you who've done it, and you know what to do, we come down the center aisles, we go to the tables, we take those little communion cups, we go back to our seat, and we take that bread, and we remember the body of Christ given for us. Then we take that juice and we remember of that we remember the, the blood of Christ shed for us. That's in whom we have redemption. So I want to invite you, if you're a baptized believer, if you're walking in repentance, that you're letting Jesus be the Lord of your life, you're not trying to bend and shape Jesus into what you want him to be, but you're submitting your life to him as best you can. We want to invite you to come and take communion. But some of you may say, I'm I can't say that I'm doing that. And that's okay. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to come and take that. That'll be fine. It's all right. But I do want you to know that you can know Jesus. Maybe maybe you're not ready to to know Christ today. Maybe you're not ready to, to, to give your life to Him today. I get that. But I'm asking you, would you be willing to just have a conversation about it? Would you be willing to have coffee with someone and talk? about what that means. Would you be willing to say, I want to learn more about who Jesus is? Then your step is take one of those connect cards, fill that out, and and tell us what, what you're thinking. Tell us what you want to do. 
and either go see somebody at the info table and have a face-to-face conversation and talk about that, or you can just take that thing and just turn it in the offering box at the very back of the room, right on the table behind the last row of seats. Just drop it in there. We'll get it. I, I know we'll get it. I know that connections team. They will get it, and they will be on you like a duck on a June bug. They will contact you, okay? They will not let you slip away. But there may be some of you that you're ready today. You're like, hey, I'm convinced. I wish you'd just shut up and tell me how to get saved. Uh, now's your time. you got to admit that you're a sinner. you got to admit that you have blind spots. you got to admit that you're broken. He don't take people that don't think that they don't need it. He only takes those who acknowledge that they do. So you've got to admit that you're broken. You've got to believe. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died on the cro- lived a perfect life, died on the cross for your sins, and rose from the grave. And that He has the power to change your life. You've got to believe that. And then you just got to tell Him. And you've got to commit and say, Jesus, my life is yours. You created all things. My life is yours. You know better than I do. My life is yours. You can, you can pray that today. And then the last one, when we're done with communion and while some of y'all are making those decisions about that, we're all going to stand and sing when Kyle starts leading us. And we're going to sing to this God. We're going to sing to this Christ by whom, through whom, and for whom all things were created. We're going to sing to this Christ who made your mouth and made your vocal cords and made your lungs and gives you breath. Use those things that He has given you to sing back to Him. Sing to this Jesus who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, by whom all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, through whom, this Christ, through whom and for whom all things were created. This Jesus, who is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Sing to Him. Give Him the praise He deserves. He is worthy of every bit of it you can muster. I'm going to pray for you. You make your decisions. And then sing with us. Lord Jesus, have your way. Have your way with us as the rightful ruler of all that ever was, all that is now, and all that ever will be. God, have your way with us. Save your people. Continue to save your people. Let us give you the praise you desire, the praise you deserve, the praise that you are worthy of in your good, good name We pray it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for that encouraging word. If you want to find out more information about The Table Church or to get more connected, visit our website at thetablephx.com. And if you're in the area and you want to worship with us in person, we worship every Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. at Arrowhead Elementary School at the corner of 75th Avenue and Union Hills. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope to see you next week.